the reputation of Christians can be, well, complicated. Rosaria Butterfield believes that followers of Jesus should be known for their humility and their genuine love for people. Imagine a world where the fruit of repentance and the practice of hospitality mark the reputations of Christians for those who do not yet believe that Jesus saves by the very same power that raised him from the grave. This is the world that the Bible imagines for us. That is the world that Jesus prays for us to create in his name. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Heaven Rules. For November 1st, 2022, I'm Dana Gresh. Well, I don't say this too often, but this series that we're in right now should probably come with a warning label. It's based on the book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I mean, think about it. If we're going to share the truth and love of Jesus Christ, we've got to be ready to welcome people into our homes. And I read this book. It is super convicting. If you've been with us this last week and this week, you've heard how God is able to use ordinary hospitality to transform lives in radical ways. That's what he did in Rosaria Butterfield's life, and he may be working in this area of your life as well. Have you felt the Lord's quiet nudge to love your neighbors in ways you've never loved them before? We're about to meet up with Rosaria and Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth at Ligonier Ministries National Conference for the final part of their conversation. As you listen, imagine how God could use your home to reach others with His life-changing grace. Here's Nancy. Rosaria, thank you so much for joining us this week here on Revive Our Hearts. And I know our listeners have been really challenged and blessed and encouraged and maybe a little scared oh, as we've talked about <laughs> radically ordinary hospitality. But thank you for um, pressing us a little bit beyond our maybe safe borders. We're going to talk a little bit about that in this closing conversation today. Your book is called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I love that title. And we have a gal on our staff who... Uh, when I'm getting ready to interview somebody, actually reads the book in advance of me. And she came up with a 24-page sheaf of notes here <laughs> and before I had the chance to read it. And then Dawn put at the end a little bit of a personal story and testimony. And I want to re- just read a bit of what this uh, team member said. She said, I read Rosaria's book on hospitality and I am totally undone. She said, I squirmed and argued my way through the introduction and first chapter, but eventually found my heart shredded by the truth. I'm convinced most Christians know nothing of genuine biblical fellowship. Sometimes God speaks in a whisper, but as I'm reading this book, God keeps shouting, do you understand? Will you obey me now? She said, since 2001, I've lived in my comfortable little neighborhood. I've prayed about my neighbors and shared Christmas treats, but over the last year, I've heard the pain in their hearts. There's a couple that just divorced, and I didn't even know they were struggling. There's a desperate, fearful woman who is losing her husband to disease and approaching death. And two precious neighbors from a rough life, afraid to go to church, because as they said, we'll just sit there and cry. Though I said, that's okay, I'll go and cry with you. They are still afraid. I need to pursue them with love. The truth is, I know about fear too. I'm afraid to reach out afraid my neighbors might misunderstand. So I've stayed in my home, doing my work, tending my responsibilities, making my home pretty, but not available beyond what I pre-schedule. My home certainly hasn't been open to strangers, arguing it's too inconvenient and costly. Even to the neighbors I pray for and grieve over, I haven't been flexible enough to stretch beyond my stuff and my schedule to meet real needs. She said, like I said, I'm totally undone. Rosaria's words made me uncomfortable, but she also gave me hope for change. The good thing about being undone is that in our messiness and brokenness, we're finally in a good place for the Lord to begin to do His work in and through us. And I wanted to share that because I think that Rosaria, uh, this is not going to be a comfortable read for everybody. It wasn't comfortable for me because though, as I've shared, I grew up in a home that was very given to hospitality. It's something very much on my heart. You pushed me beyond some of what I consider 
safe and planned hospitality to more spontaneous and flexible. And as you've said, this doesn't look the same for everybody in every season of life. And we want to emphasize that. Absolutely. And I don't want people to be scared. But, you know, as we move more into a post-Christian world, we're probably going to see more converts like me. And what I mean by that are people who really came from a lot of sin. Sin that I committed and sin that other people committed that landed on me. And with that, whether good or bad, you get a little less fussiness about boundaries. Yeah. And I and I and I'm not trying to be critical when I say that. I mean I we I kinda kid around. I'm the boundaryless butterfield, you know. I I'm not good with boundaries, um, and I move in. And I sometimes I move in, and I know that there are well-meaning Christians who would say, you know, wait, slow down, or, you know, how do you know there's a problem? And, but, you know, pretty much each and every time, you know what, people's lives are messy. Life without Christ is really hard. And I think people who have been Christians for a long time, it's almost like you forget that. And you wouldn't be a Christian today. No. If it hadn't been for the willingness no. of Ken and Floy Smith to... Reaching into my life. And bringing in your messiness into their home. Absolutely. That is absolutely right. And I think that sometimes we feel awkward. We think, well, what if, what if we offend people? Or what if, really, they're all fine and they don't need my Jesus? Well, then you have a theology problem because really... Because nobody's fine. We all need Jesus. Life without Jesus is really hard. It has some terrifying edges. And I think that's what I want people to know, because I know there are people who hear me talk and they think, well, but... But what about the children? Well, In I, fact, we have a, a mom with a toddler who's been sitting listening to this conversation. Yes. And we asked her on a break, we did. what, what do are you want? wanting to know? <laughs> and she said, how does this look with a toddler and you want to protect your children? Right. You want to keep them safe? That's right. To That's which right. you say. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh I agree. I, in fact, your, your first covenantal responsibility is to your family and to keep them safe. You would be negligent if you put your children in harm's way. And, and so I will just tell you some of the things that we do in our home to keep some safety barriers around some of this. We know that Satan can attack all of these barriers, so we're not going to act as though this is the, the end-all and the be-all of this conversation. But Listen, no family is safe no. if Christ isn't present there. He's our, he's our refuge and our fortress and our safety. He is. He is. And, you, and no marriage is safe. I mean, the edges are so raw without Christ. But, but, you know, we were licensed foster parents for 10 years. And so that meant for 10 years, we had some basic rules in our house. And those rules have been very helpful. So when people say, wow, these are really creative rules. Where did you learn them? Well, I learned them from the welfare state. You know, (laughs) there they are for you to have too. And so some of these might make it look like we are the no fun couple. And in some, in some way, that might be true. Like, for example, there's just no alcohol in our house. I don't think it's sinful to drink alcohol, but you know what? For the years that we were licensed foster parents with teenagers in the house, no alcohol was just a really wise idea. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that has allowed us to do is to become easily home studied, to have prisoners in our home from a minimum security prison uh, who are needing to be getting out there out of the incarcerated um, context. And, and actually, these are, these are men who also come to our church. Um, and they have release time. And they have release time. They have, in fact, it's exactly five hours. And often when they're in our home, a security guard has to wander through and make sure everything's okay. Um, so by having no alcohol, that's a basic thing uh, that keeps everybody safe. And what does it mean? It means we don't get to have alcohol. Well, you know what? That's okay with us because yeah. there's a greater good that's being served. So that's one thing. Another thing is we... Um, we do not allow people to wander into the bedroom area of the house when we have dinner. And the children are not ever allowed to be in a room with any person who isn't either one of their parents or their designated person. So I have a friend who travels with me, helps me with the children. She's my sister in the Lord. She's like an aunt to my children. She's on the approved list. She's on the approved <laughs> list. But you know what? We're that explicit with our children. And, for, and, and, we, and we remind them every moment of this. 
Uh, so, so we because it's hard for children, and especially children with special needs. They think that if they see a person at the library story time three times, that's your friend. Mm-hmm. Say, no, you can't get in the, you know, never get in the car, never be in a room. Nobody can touch you. We talk a lot about body things. Talk to a parent, talk to a parent, talk to a parent. But yeah. for the most part, when we have open fellowship, we're all in, in the a dining group setting. Room. Yeah. We're in the dining room. We're in the homeschool room. We're in the living room. But, you know, our children are old enough to understand these rules. Toddlers are not. And so when you have very small children, you must be, uh, you know, I mean, it's the ultimate hypervigilant job. And Mm -hmm. you wonder if you are ever going to ever ever actually relax after your children survive toddlerhood. (laughs) I have a dear friend from church who was um, really inspired to practice hospitality. She's one of the most hospitable people I know. She moved into a new area. She has two children, ages one and five. And what she decided was that she would have a ministry explicitly to children and moms. Lives in a cul-de-sac, wrote handwritten notes to every single person, invited them all over for Bible story time at her house Monday mornings. And everybody came. I mean, the moms who are not Christian came. You know why? They're lonely. Mm-hmm. And it gave you a reason to take a shower and leave your house. <laughs> and you know you're an overachiever when you have a toddler and you shower and leave your house, right? I mean, it's a, so, so it was, it's been wonderful in that way. But then my friend, who is a, a very faithful Christian, she also learned about some of the needs in each of these homes. And, you know, one of the basic things is how do I go grocery shopping with kids on different nap schedules. Well, all these moms started doing grocery shopping for each other. You know, they just they just became a team. And then yeah. from that, a husband-wife Bible study started. And these are not believers. Yeah. Let me just say this. This is not the church. They were not believers altogether. But, but there was a need for community. My friend, who's a Christian, saw that. She put Jesus at the center of that community by using Dana Dirksen's music and teaching children Bible stories. And soon the moms were curious, is it true? Does God answer our prayers? Are we alone in this world? Is there a purpose for my life? Is there meaning in my suffering? How would my marriage be different if my husband and I were both submitted to Christ? These were questions that came out of children's story time. But one of the things that was so vital about what she does is she does it every Monday morning. It's not the third Monday of the month, bring a dish. Oh, Mm -hmm. oh, that's the other thing. It's come as you are. Come in your pajamas. Even if you haven't had your shower. Come in, yeah, yeah, (laughs) don't be an overachiever. Just come. Yeah. And and that's the way you are about your home as well. Right. It's right. not you you know you may still have some homeschooling stuff going oh, yeah. on. You've you've got in various stages of this is not entertaining. This is not entertaining. And your menus and your meals and your table settings. Right. You paint a picture for us in your right. book that it's it's very real. It's very real and it gives other people a chance to minister. You know, I, my life is pretty messy. There are a lot of the Lord has sent a number of people who are struggling with a number of things. I remember once I was on a Skype conversation with a friend who was struggling, and it was about 5 o'clock, which isn't an ideal time for me to still be on Skype because I need to get dinner ready. And one of the single men in our church who, you know, he walked in and he could see that I was ministering to a friend. And he looked at me and he did this. He kind of gave me the, get out of here. I can handle dinner. And truly, I thought to myself, I don't even know that this man can cook, but okay. (laughs) And so I took my computer to the homeschool room, closed the door, talked with my friend who was struggling, and came out a half an hour later, and the guy had dinner ready. He did a fine job. Get that guy a wife. You know, yeah, well, (laughs) he he did a great job. Stepped in. He's part of the family. And it made him feel really good. Yeah, and needed. And needed. And, And that's what a hospitality home says. It doesn't say, well... We, here are the hosts and here are the guests. A hospitality home says Jesus was both host and guest. And hospitality is different from counterfeit hospitality. See, the problem is too many Christians rely on counterfeit hospitality, and we don't have any need for real hospitality. Counterfeit hospitality is the hospitality you can buy. You're in charge of it. You're the giver. You're the giver. You don't have to be the taker. You don't have to be the receiver. That's humbling. 
but in a home where people really are gathered together, and you really see a picture of that home in the Book of Acts. Mm -hmm. What was it about that home that was the place that all the people prayed for Peter? You know, those kinds of things. What was it? Well, who knows? Maybe it was big enough. Maybe it had a certain location that made it easy. Maybe, who knows? But it just was. Yes. It's the place that people gathered. So in our house, you know, we don't, the kids know how to set the table. Um, they know and how not to, everything matches. Oh, my goodness. No, 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 <laughs> no. Things do not match. And, and I, you know, I sort of kid around that if you start to, you know, a good mantra is lower your expectations, increase your joy. So we're not talking about Pinterest perfect. No, no, no. You would table never. settings. You would not. There's no one that I know of who's ever come into my house and wanted to take a picture of. <laughs> and nothing wrong with that. But that no. shouldn't be something that intimidates or keeps us from exercising right. hospitality. Absolutely. And I love the fact that I have friends who do like to decorate. So ours is the home that we gather at for holidays. So we'll have everybody over on Easter, including our prisoners that I had mentioned. And I have a friend who just came to me and said, I'll decorate. And I know what that means because, you know, I don't decorate. I vacuum. (laughs) <laughs> I vacuum. And, you know, we have pets, and so people should be thankful that I vacuum. But if somebody wants to decorate, great. I'm, you know, I, all for it. But but I, I just want to make it sensible. And, and speaking of uh, vacuuming, let me just read a quote oh. from your book. You wrote this, Rosaria. Hospitality is necessary whether you have cat hair on the couch or not. People will die of chronic loneliness sooner than they will die from cat hair in the soup. Yes, I know. And I mean, I, I'm sure that that... For, that's a little for, gross. I know. For the people who are not cat lovers, you know, that's a little... That's, you know, but you're but, making a point there. we got to decide what really matters. And people matter more than stuff and things. And, uh, right, right. And right. we can make so easily an idol out of being uncluttered mm-hmm. or having things picture perfect. Right. Or meals. The way you talk about it in this book, your meals can be really simple. They are really simple. In fact, most of my meals are worked out in the early morning. So I start out with um, pretty much all of my meals have a base of rice and beans and maybe a chicken. And, and then I'll add some vegetables to it. And that's, that's pretty much it. I had somebody today ask me if I have a cookbook for some of the soup recipes that I make. And, you know, I, I don't. I just, I just can, I kind of wing it in some ways. But, I, you know, I've been doing this for years. I don't work from recipes. I, I enjoy it. I spend a lot of time in, in the kitchen. I enjoy it, but there are things I don't do. I mean, I will spend hours chopping vegetables and listening to a sermon. I spend mm. zero time on social media. You're and making choices about what matters. You're making choices. And, and, and I, that's not because I think social media is inherently evil, but I would rather talk to people in real time. Yeah, And I would rather listen to catch up on all of the sermons I want to hear throughout the week and chop vegetables than, than, than sit at my computer. I, I, it's just, you know, life is always about selection and sacrifice. I want to change tack here for just okay. a moment um, because your life, your being in Christ, you were, as you talk about in another book, an unlikely convert. And God right. used hospitality he to did. reach out to you, to right. bridge to Christ. Right. And uh, this is something you had the joy of being a part of in relation to your own mother. You call yes. it deathbed hospitality. Yes. And yes. I know there are points of crisis and points where you've had a family member or somebody that you're close to that for years and years, it just seems like they are the most yes. unlikely possibility to oh become goodness. a convert. Oh, but absolutely. God moved in an extraordinary way. And I, Robert and I were hearing this story as it was unfolding. You've shared it in this book. Can you give us a nutshell oh, version yes. of what God did there? Oh, that was amazing. So my mom was, she was hurt as a child, very much so. And she was not treated well. And, um, and she grew up with a high suspicion of men. And she also had absolutely no use for the church. And um, about the only time I would ever hear my mother use the name of Jesus would be as a curse word. Mm -hmm. And um, when I came out as a lesbian when I was 28, that really did not rock my mother's world. I mean, I think her position was, you're still getting tenure, right? (laughs) You know, like, professionally, we're okay, right? You know, as long as I was professionally okay, 
what I did with my own life and my body was perfectly up to me. And she even said, I completely understand it. I, you know, men are just, you know, men are dangerous. You know, you get a couple of good ones out there, but for the most part, it's not safe. Mm -hmm. After Kent and I got married, and then we moved to North Carolina, we had been married for, for quite some time, actually, at that point, my mom moved with us. And she lived with us for um, 16 months. And during that time, she mocked our faith. She um, challenged Kent when he would try to do family devotions. I mean, it was really awful. She would tell our children that this was wrong, that you know, intelligent people don't believe in these supernatural things. And um, highly resistant. Oh, it was it was really rough. And you know, I was writing books, and uh, you know, and, and these were very hard. At a certain point, after. Uh, the, the second book, Openness Unhindered, came out. So there are two books that, that sort of are tied together. One is Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, and the other is Openness Unhindered, Further Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, <laughs> about I sexual identity and union with Christ. And my mom read both of those books. And she came to me after reading both of those books, and she said, Rosaria, I've read both of your books, and I'm not weak like you. Maybe if I were weak like you... I would want to know this Jesus, want to have a life like you have, but I'm not weak like you, but I do want to tell you, I'm dying. Hmm. I was just diagnosed with lung cancer, and I want to die my way, and I don't want you or your religion um, interfering with me and how I'm going to die. And so that was a very, you know, that was probably the biggest faith crisis of my life, because the hardest people to witness to are your family yeah. because they know your sin better than you do. You know, there's no, there's no fake in it. Mm. They've been sinned against by you. Um, well, in God's providence, I was able to spend the last 10 days of my mother's life with her in hospice. Kent took care of everything so that I literally just sat at her bedside the whole time. Mm. And at a certain point, and dying is very rough. I mean, I just, you know, it is, it is, a, it is a, a, a vile process. You watch someone die, and even in hospice with plenty of morphine, and you know that death is a curse. Um, and at a certain point, I just prayed. And I'm a, I'm a singer. I sang, I sang through the Psalter. I sang the Psalms. And at a certain point, my mother said, she just sat up and she looked at me and she said, well, I guess I'm weak like you now. I, I guess I'm weak like you now. Why don't you tell me, tell me about this gospel, you know? But why don't, I don't believe. Why don't I believe? If I'm weak like you, why don't I believe? And, mm. and I said, well, Mom, I don't think it's the gospel that you don't know. I think it's the shepherd you don't know. Mm. You seem to have the big strokes, but it's the person that you don't know. And my mother, in her very practical way, said, fine, okay, I'm dying. Tell me about this. Tell me about him. That began a fascinating time in my relationship with my mom. It only lasted for two days because she died very quickly after that. But um, Kent and I started to read every Bible passage we knew of that told us about Jesus the shepherd and Jesus shepherding. And my mother had this immediate and, and totally opposite response where she couldn't hear enough of it. Hmm. She'd say, read me more, tell me more. And then at a certain point, she sat up in bed. You know, it's funny, people who are dying, they can't, they can't move their mouth, but all of a sudden they're like looking like they're going to walk out of the room. She sat up in bed. She said, well, but wait a second. What am I going to do about my sin? I don't want to talk to a priest. What, what am I going to do? About I said, well, you have to talk to the priest, the priest Jesus. Yeah. You need to confess your sin and have confidence that he will forgive you. She said, but I don't have to talk to you about it. Nope, I'm not your priest. Great, good. <laughs> and it was very rough. My mom was a, she was a rough around the edges woman. She had worked hard and had had a hard life. But two days before she died, I had the amazing privilege of seeing her commit her life to Jesus. And that was, that was amazing. My mother died and I had no regrets. I talk about it in the book. We had had a rough go together, my mom and I. Um, I couldn't be all the things she wanted me to be. I was the daughter that 
you know, it was very hard. We had a very hard relationship. But when she died in the Lord, it was as though all of the things that had been wounding to me in our relationship prior to that, it was like the Lord just filled them out. He just, his blood just filled out those those crevices of bad patterns. And it was with no regrets that we buried my mother. And, you know, that was the moment that I realized that God is merciful and he hears your prayers. And I went to my homeschool co-op, which was a few days later, and and one of my friends said, oh, Rosaria, what happened? Did, Did your mom ever come to faith? I looked at her and I said, well, you know, I don't know. I mean, maybe it was the morphine talking. I mean, she said all the right things. And this friend, you know, homeschool moms just give you the smack down. She just turned to me and she said, you know what? You know what, sister? When you came to faith, there are a lot of people who didn't believe it either. So guess what? Jesus saved sinners just like you, just like me. Mm -hmm. Praise God for what he did in your mom's life. Mm -hmm. And quit worrying about morphine. Praise God for friends who can do that because it's, it's terrifying. But... And as you said in your book, it changed her future. It changed her future but it changed and our past. Your past as well. It changed our past. I don't have any. I don't have any of those regrets. I don't have any of those, those what ifs. Those those childhood. You know those losses, because because salvation, in the forward motion of salvation, that resolves the backward glance. Of history. Yeah. Jesus rewrites history. And the gospel changes individuals, but it also changes community. It changes the body. And that was one of the most powerful Christian lessons of my life. Rosaria, at the end of your book, the gospel comes with a house key in which you just unpack this beautiful subject of practicing radically ordinary hospitality. You had a stirring section that you called, What If? And you said, imagine a world where every Christian practiced radically ordinary hospitality. Paint for us just in a minute here what that might look like. Help us imagine. Well, exactly. And you know, Christians need to work imaginatively. And we need to work imaginatively in a hopeful epic, literarily speaking, formation. We need to think through what if, knowing that the what if that that Jesus holds is all good. So I did. I asked, what if, imagine a world where every Christian practiced radically ordinary hospitality as either host or guest. Imagine a world where every Christian made a covenant of church membership and honored it. Imagine a world where every Christian tithed and where we lived intentionally below our means, having enough to share, and maybe even moving into neighborhoods that need us more than we need them. Imagine a world where living as image bearers of a holy God meant something, something that changed the way we saw ourselves and others. Imagine a world where neighbors said that Christians throw the best parties in town and are the go-to people for big problems and issues without being invited. Imagine if the children in the neighborhood knew that the Christians were safe people to ask for help when unthinkable agony canvassed their private or family lives. Imagine a world where men lived as men of God and women lived as women of God and children, including those not yet born, were valued as children of God One where gender and sexuality roles were known to be blessings to others, even when they required great sacrifice. One where being born male or female comes with distinct blessings and constraints, and where our roles as men and women were valued as high and distinctive callings. Imagine a world where every Christian knew his neighbors sufficiently to be of earthly and spiritual good. Imagine a world where every Christian knew by name people who lived in poverty or prison, felt tied to them and to their futures, and lived differently because of it. Imagine a world where sexuality was safe, 
within the confines of biblical boundaries and was not unleashed in rape, incest, pornography, and self-harm. Imagine a world where biblical patriarchy, the benevolent leading of servant-hearted fathers, made all of us breathe a sigh of relief, knowing that the good fathers would protect us from the roving gangs of evil men. Imagine a world where the fruit of repentance and the practice of hospitality mark the reputations of Christians for those who do not yet believe that Jesus saves by the very same power that raised him from the grave. Imagine a world where people take back the night in prayer. Imagine a world where you know the names of your neighbors and you play cards with them and eat meals together, praying for the children in the neighborhood and lending a helping hand before you are asked. Imagine a world where no one languishes in crushing loneliness, where no abused woman or man or child suffers alone, where people take their real and pressing problems to Christians who have the reputation of being helpers and where victims are not swept away lost, forgotten. Imagine a world where people fear God more than men and serve God more than comfort. Imagine a world where the power of the gospel to change lives is ours to behold. This is the world that the Bible imagines for us. That is the world that Jesus prays for us to create in his name. Not because any of this, tithing, church membership, hospitality, advocating for victims, is heaven on earth. It is not. Rather, we do these things so that we can prepare arm in arm for what is coming next, for the return of Christ, for our inheritance in the new heavens and the new earth so that we can warn our neighbors of the real judgment to come so that we can honor our God and King. That is the nuts and bolts of it, starting with you and me and our open door and our dinner table and our house key, poised for the giving. This is not complex. Radically ordinary daily Christianity is not PhD Christianity. The gospel coming with a house key is ABC Christianity. Radically ordinary and daily hospitality is the basic building block for vital Christian living. Start anywhere, but please do start. That's Rosaria Butterfield reading from her book, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. Here's the subtitle. Practicing Radically Ordinary Hospitality in Our Post-Christian World. She's been talking with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth about how hospitality is essential for the life of a believer. If you're interested in ordering Rosaria's book, you'll find more information in the transcript of today's program at reviveourhearts.com. Radically Ordinary Daily Christianity is not Ph.D. Christianity. It's ABC Christianity. That's what Rosaria said. When I think of other elements of the faith that have been building blocks for my Christian life, I think of two words, heaven rules. Such a simple message, right? But being able to rest in God's sovereignty changes how we live each day. If you'd love to fill your home with reminders that heaven rules, you can. Request a copy of the 2023 Revive Our Hearts wall calendar when you make a donation of any amount right now. Hang it in your living room or your kitchen, and every time you walk by, the beautiful images and Bible verses will remind you that the Lord is in control. To make a donation and request your copy, visit reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1-800-569-5959. That's 1-800-569-5959. What do you do when you feel like your faith is unraveling? Elisa Childers was walking down the road of deconstruction and doubt. She needed the Lord to show up in an intellectual way, and He did. Tomorrow, she shares her story. Please be back for Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, calling you to use your home to point to the gospel and help others experience freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.